throwing the bikes uh, around a muddy field, up and down bankings, running up muddy slopes, riding through streams. Uh, there was a certain section of the road down through a castle. And I was absolutely hooked. I couldn't believe it. And my dad's like, do you want to have a go? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you can imagine, an 11 year old kid, nothing better than getting muddy with your mates. Right, well, hello, Mick Collins from Yorkshire in the UK. I'm now 43 years old, been a lifelong cyclist. Started in about 92, really. And yeah, done almost anything and everything you can imagine in cycling. If it involves a bike, I'm generally involved in it. Yeah, that, that's a, a great start. I mean, if you're watching the video stream, you can see that, you know, he's sitting in the, the front of a bike shop right now. You got a bike behind you. My understanding is that you have several jobs that actually involve biking. So can you maybe go into what each of those are? Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you said, numerous jobs. So I've got three different jobs. Number one, I work in the bike shop where I am now. When I'm not in the bike shop, two days a week, I am in schools teaching children uh, road safety cycling. So we take them out on the road, show them where they should be riding, how they should be riding, things like that. And then when I'm not doing that, I have another job as a tour guide, mainly in France at the minute, might be further afield. But yeah, two tours this year, taking people from the very top of France down to the very bottom over 14 days. So yeah, showing people uh, showing people the country. It's great. I love it. And is, is that all primarily road bike or are you doing all types of bikes? The tours, they are 100% on the road, yeah. I've spoken to the boss and he is thinking of doing some gravel tours, so I can't wait to get into that. That would be fantastic if we could. Yeah. That's great. So there's a lot of ways we could pull this apart. I, we were talking before Colin, the main thing we want to cover in this episode is kind of seeing the world through through biking. Um, yeah. I know that you used to do this competitively, you do the tours now, you are in the UK, so you've you've gotten to visit several different countries, most of Europe, the United Kingdom, I think you even said Africa uh, yeah. on a bike and you know through gravel, mountain, road bike, there's just there's just so many things that it sounds like you've done with us. Um, yeah. can can you maybe take a step back and go into growing up like how you actually did this competitively and and what that was? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, it started in, I mean, my old man, my dad, he was a cyclist when he was younger. So when I was born and growing up, my dad always used to watch the Tour de France and everything. Uh, and then uh, cyclocross, which is like a winter sport, uh, is basically riding road bikes around a field in winter. The World Championships for that was in Leeds, which is my hometown where I was born. Uh, so we went across to watch that. And it's just, imagine a... An 11-year-old kid at the time watching men throwing the bikes uh, around a muddy field, up and down bankings, running up muddy slopes, riding through streams. Uh, there was a certain section of the road down through a castle. And I was absolutely hooked. I couldn't believe it. And my dad's like, do you want to have a go? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you can imagine, an 11-year-old kid, nothing better than getting muddy with your mates. So I didn't know this. The week after, there was a local event uh, near us, uh, but it was at a private boarding school. So we all jumped in the car with the family and we're going out to this private boarding school and I'm like, where are we going? He's like, oh, we're going, you know, you've been misbehaving. We're taking you to boarding school. We're going to show you around so you know what to expect. And then we just try, you know, mess with me a little bit. And we got there and there was this little local event going on. Again, a load of grown men riding around the field, running up and down slopes with the bikes on the back in the mud. And uh, he kind of said, you know, this is... This is it on a local level. This is where you're going to start. There's no crowds. There's one man and his dog, and there's somebody's wife watching. Do you still want to do it? I'm like, yeah, can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. And that was it. The week after, I went and did my uh, my first event as an under 12, and I've been racing ever since. So from cyclocross, I got into road racing, into mountain biking. I was fortunate enough that I was good enough to get on a team in France. Spent four years living in France, racing in Holland, Belgium, Spain, Luxembourg, all over, racing, getting paid for it, which was even better. Managed to get to a certain level, realised I wasn't going to be where I wanted to be, and came home and joined the real world with a job, which at the time was a postman, <laughs> but has since turned into working in a bike shop again with bikes. So I can't leave them behind. They seem to follow me everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. I, is there anything that you can share about training through Europe and some of the countries countryside, all the different things you got to see while on the bike? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
It's totally where I mean where I lived. It was totally different to anywhere in the UK. Other than I mean, I spent two years in Lille, which is on the Belgian border. And what's similar to the UK with that where I'm from is it's always wet and windy. So um, going through cyclocross, I was quite a good bike handler, which helped really a lot in Belgium. I did quite well in some Belgian races because they race on the cobblestones an awful lot. So they're always wet, they're always slippery, they're always muddy. It's not a contact sport cycling, but there is quite a bit of contact sometimes. So arguing with big burly Belgians bouncing off you and things like that. But uh, yeah, you got to see some incredible sights and travel all over. So whether that was riding around the Pyrenees on training camps, going up to Holland and battling in the crosswinds with the huge Dutchman, or racing around Luxembourg and Metz and Strasbourg in the uh, in the Vosges in France. Yeah, it was just incredible seeing all these places. So and getting paid for it, which is quite unbelievable. I don't know why I stopped so early. <laughs> I've been to Europe one time, and we went to uh, Paris, France, and Santorini, Greece, and it, it still baffles me. Like what we saw was the the deep city, and then you see all these videos of France and just like the vast open countryside. I, I know it's like that in the United States and everything too, but just not having much experience in Europe, I. I feel like there's so much countryside that I have like not even scratched the surface on. And I, I would have to imagine that in your training and your competitions, you probably got to bike, you know, more or less all of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you're racing, you don't see much anyway, but um, you've always got your head out the window as you're driving down in the cars, looking at places. But yeah, when you're actually racing yourself, you're so involved in the race. Um, I mean, you you can't move. Even having a drink on the bike, the, the bunch is so tightly packed and everything that even having a drink on the bike's a bit of a risk because you're always going to move it a little bit. So you're concentrating that hard that when you're racing, you don't see that much. But uh, yeah, certainly if you, if you if you were going away racing uh, at any point, you'd always have a day there before or after. So you got to ride around a little bit and see it. And uh, I think that was always the major attraction for me anyway. Even racing, it was going to some new places, seeing some new things. And uh, always wanting to know what's around that next corner. You know, you never wanted a, a training ride to end because you always wanted to go a little bit further and see what was over there, you know. If you went north on one training ride, the next one you went south. Uh, just to try and see as much as you possibly could, yeah. And were, were these races, uh, like, what was the length of them? What was the, uh, was it in the city? Was it in the countryside? Uh, were these, like, real technical where you're doing lots of tight tight corners and everything or is it just, yeah uh... um, it was a bit of everything really so there's there's criterium racing which is in the town centers uh laps are usually a kilometer um, uh, a kilometer two kilometers long uh and the tight little short circuits you just you're doing i mean i once did a race and it was 140 laps <laughs> it was unbelievable i can't believe we didn't get dizzy and they're really tight technical circuits loads and loads of corners uh, and the crowd love it because you're coming around every couple of minutes so they're fantastic but then you get to do some of the bigger races so like in the tour of luxembourg you're riding through the Vosges, you're riding through Luxembourg, out into the countryside, uh, and you don't hardly see anybody, but you're riding through these incredible mountains and, you know, or across agricultural fields on either side of you, seeing the wheat and barley growing and things like that. So it just depends on what event you were doing. So um, in Belgium, you'd be fighting across the cobblestones and the concrete roads on windswept roads and things like that. So, yeah, it just depended on the event itself and what you specialised in. So... I wasn't especially good at one particular thing, so I got to go all over. It was quite good, and uh, yeah, it was it was a fantastic experience seeing everywhere. That's great. And so you said that you're doing small loops in some cases, but what, what were the like mileage lengths of these events? Uh, well, criteriums. So in the town centres, they were usually like an hour plus five laps, or an hour plus ten laps, or something like that. When you went out and did the big road races. Uh, because I was always uh, under 23 at the time, so doing mainly under 23 races and things like that, furthest we'd race would be about 120, 130 mile. They never really got much further than that. Um, and so, you know, it, it just depended on how hilly it was as well. If it was incredibly hilly, uh, then it'd be a little bit short. It might be 70 or 80 miles. But yeah, some of the flatter races, like Paris-Roubaix and things like that, I think we did about 120 miles when we did that, but you know, 
30, 40 mile of it was on the cobblestones. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and then, like, so you kind of got us to the age of 23. Like, when did you actually decide to stop doing this? And I assume you moved back to the UK from there? I did, yeah. Went back to the UK. Uh, I just realised I was getting paid a little bit, but not an awful lot. And I realised I could carry on doing what I was doing. But by the time I got to my mid-30s, I'd have nothing apart from a load of memories and not a right lot of money. So I went back to the UK and joined the real world with a job. Uh, and then just still wanted to see the world, still wanted to get around. So I started loading up the bike and doing a load of touring. So went across uh, Eastern Europe, all around Italy, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, you know, Serbia, Buda, uh, well, I say Budapest, but Hungary and all that area. Uh, Southeast Asia, so I rode through Thailand and Vietnam and everything. Just anywhere new and different, really, and uh, try to find somebody to come along with me as well who was willing to put up with me. <laughs> Not always easy. I, yeah, I didn't realize that you did. You actually toured that much. When when you were doing all this, it was strictly bike, right? You didn't have a car or anything. You're just No, just no, no. We point A to point B. No, that was it. So we'd fly into point A and we'd fly out of point B. But um, you'd try and keep them two distances fairly short. Uh, but you'd just you'd go like that in between <laughs> to try and see the maximum amount that you could, you know. And then if, if the weather was absolutely horrific, you'd just have a short day and you'd go to the pub, <laughs> you know, or walk around the city. So, I mean, one of the best ever tours I did was uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, we flew into Prague in the Czech Republic and then down to Vienna in Austria. Uh, crossed to Bratislava, uh, crossed to Budapest, and then we finished in Serbia. So we went through five capital cities. So you'd fly into the, you'd get into the capital city at the start. So we had a big night out. The next day we packed his bikes up, had a walk around the town, and then the day after we rode on, got into the next capital city. Big night out in the pubs. The next day we'd have a look around the town, then the next day move on, and that was just fantastic because he got to see five different countries and experience five different capital cities, and that was just marvelous, you know. So. Yeah. yeah, as I as I interview more people, I mean, I'm talking to ultra marathon runners, uh, bikers like yourself, like hikers. Um, it's it's so interesting to see like what people prefer to do to travel. Like some people run commute, they'll run between towns or whatever. And like, I guess I'm curious why why you prefer to bike as your 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 method of travel, like you could have probably done that same exact thing with renting a car, you know, their car rental probably would have been just as expensive as flying your bike out there. Um, yeah. But, but you still chose to do it that way. Um, and, and I, I just kind of want you to maybe explain that a little bit to me. Uh, I mean, I've always, I've always done everything on a bike, but I think that the, the good thing about a bike is if you're trying to run somewhere, it's pretty difficult to run more than a marathon every day for most human beings, you know, and even to do that, you'd have to be incredibly fit and in the top few percent on a bike. It's relatively easy for most people to do 50 miles a day. And that's quite a big distance that you can cover. But if you, if you got into a car and just went from city to city, You'd miss all the little bits in between. And cities are always geared up for tourists. You know, everybody speaks English now in, in most places. But they don't, and the places in between. So you call into the little coffee shops or the little villages or the little pop-up shops or you're riding past farmers and waving. You get the weather. You get to experience the weather. You actually feel like you're travelling through a country rather than in a car in your little air conditioned box you know you don't get to feel you you know you get to feel the smells change as you travel from area to area it's just everything about it you know you're fully immersed within that country and uh, that's the best thing about it really and the people that you meet you know the, it um i'm going to sound like a bit of a psycho now but i was watching a uh film ages ago and i can't remember where it was i can't remember if it was in the states or what and it was uh two mass murderers and their little thing about how they interacted with people and found their victim was they had bikes on the back of the van and their reasoning was if you see somebody on a bike they're usually harmless because they're usually local and it makes it easier to approach people and talk to people uh and i just love that it, it, it does make it a lot easier to, to you know if you turn up to a coffee shop on a bike people just start talking to you for some reason and i've no idea what it is <laughs> It's, it's just great. It's brilliant. The, the whole interaction is just fantastic and meeting people. I think that that makes total sense. I mean, 
it, it seems like anytime you are wearing your hobby on your sleeve, you know, you, you wear a hat with a motorcycle logo or something like it makes you very approachable and, and people are so curious when they see you pull up on a bike, realize you're not from around there. And yeah. then you have this whole story to tell about how you're touring, you know, Eastern Europe on a bike. And, you know, I assume that that's more common than maybe in the States, but it's still something that a lot of people don't do. And, uh, it just, it makes you interesting and you worth talking to. Yeah. It gives, it gives anybody an opening to talk to you, you know, where have you come from, where you're going, they'll see the tent on the back and, oh my God, you're camping as well. You're riding that far, you know? So yeah, it, uh, it's a great opening and a great way to meet people. It's fantastic. Is it, is it very common for people to bike across Europe like that? Uh, it certainly is within my circles because everybody rides a bike. Um, the hardest thing is um, finding people to do it with, really. So, I mean, if you're married with two kids, it's always really difficult to get a few weeks away if the wife or the kids don't want to go and do it. So I suppose that's the hard part. But, uh, yeah, almost everybody I know is into touring, whether it's just for a weekend or something like that. So we're quite lucky we can jump on a ferry and go across to Holland uh and just have a long weekend whether it's friday saturday sunday but you know you can experience a new country as easy as that uh and now with the internet booking digs is just you know it's easy you just you turn up into a town on booking.com and you can you can find somewhere to sleep nice and easy so yeah i know there's a big biking scene in the united states but when i think about you know getting across straight state to state you have just very very busy interstates and it wouldn't make for a very fun ride like riding alongside of a busy highway just sounds mm. kind of miserable. Um, and I don't know, I, I mean, can you pretty much get anywhere you need to in Europe without touching these psychotically busy oh. roads? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, even in the UK, we've got tiny little single track roads absolutely everywhere where you'll barely see a car. Uh, Holland has got cycle lanes absolutely everywhere. Um, France, the amount of roads in France where there's no traffic whatsoever is just fantastic. Um, you can easily avoid the dual carriageways and the main roads. Uh, there's plenty of apps you can go on that'll, that'll suggest routes, and there's now you know various websites where you can just upload a route instantly, whether it's road, gravel, mountain bike, and yeah, you can barely see a car from day to day on some of the routes that they take you on. Uh, yeah, it's just getting better and better as well as more and more people get on bikes again, thankfully. That's great. I'm sure that's a, a big part of that is the fact that the, that Europe was established much earlier than the United than you, the United States. So they yeah. they have a lot of the foundation and infrastructure there to support biking. And whereas we kind of jumped straight to the automobile and built up everything around yeah. that. Yeah, very much so. Like we've got all the canal networks and the old railways. So the railways in the UK, where they tore them all up in the 60s, a lot of them have now been turned into uh, cycle tracks. So you can ride down railways for 20 or 30 miles and not see another car, you know, just a bloke walking his dog or something. So, yeah, it's nice to get away from the traffic. That's very cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what, like, you talked a little bit about Eastern Europe. I mean, you said you went all the way out to Asia as well. So you just like flew yeah. in, saw a few countries and flew back. Like how long are these trips that you're doing? That that one in Southeast Asia, that was three weeks that. So we flew into Ho Chi Minh City uh, and then rode across the bottom of Vietnam, which is only quite narrow. And then we rode across Cambodia and then down into Thailand and down into Thailand and finished on Phuket and then flew home again. So that was over three weeks. That was incredible. That Plenty of stories about that place. It's just it's the most surreal incredible place i've ever ridden a bike yeah it was fantastic i've always wanted to get out to to taiwan and southeast asia so um yeah. I, i'd be interested to hear some of those stories but that we'll probably get into get into later in the episode um, yeah sure but, so you're you're still doing a lot of this this traveling but you're also you've also you know made this a part of your job like how did you come across this bike tour job that you do and uh you know maybe tell us about some of the trips that you help run yeah well uh, i've got an incredibly understanding wife which is the main thing <laughs> so she lets me get away with doing these trips so um if i can do these trips and get paid for it even better so um it was just through instagram really i saw them doing these trips on instagram and i've got a friend who works for a different company and i just sent them a message 
and said, you know, do you need any more guides? Do you need any more help? And uh, they don't, they're not too far from us. They're only 45 minutes away. So he said, yeah, call over. So I rode over on my bike, had a chat to him, um, kind of told him what I'd done, you know, so I work in a bike shop. Uh, I speak French uh, and I'm never off a bike. And he just kind of said, you sound ideal, actually. So um, it just put me on the first three tours I've done have all been in France, French speaking and the mechanics. So I, I tick quite a few boxes for them. So it's, it's just great. And the amount of people that come on them, uh, I mean, there's about 25 people in each group and they're all fantastic. They're all absolutely brilliant people. You know, they're all excited to see something. So to see that and to share that and to show them things that, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's an amazing job. I can't, I can't get enough of it. So I'm always gutted when I have to come home. <laughs> How many do you guys do a year? And is it, if you do groups of 25, is it all one group or do you sometimes combine multiple groups of people? Uh, it's, it's just one group, but, um, you could just book on on your own if you wanted and you just meet people on the tour. So the, the last group I had was 25 Americans. Uh, the group before that, there was 25, but there were seven Americans and all the rest were from the UK, but spread out all over the UK, you know. Uh, so, yeah, you just you just book yourself on and, and, and off you go. <laughs> yeah, it's fairly simple. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. So, and you make some great friends from it as well. I, see, I speak to nearly all of everybody who's done the who's done the trips, all the little groups, because you set up a WhatsApp group to make sure everybody can chat and share pictures and things like that. And every group I've been a part of so far, there's still chat goes on nearly every week, you know, about the trip or what they might be doing or somebody's just done another event and they tell each other all about it. So the camaraderie that gets built up over that two weeks is incredible, you know. And I assume that that's like, you do, you took in a bunch of Americans, so it's kind of you sign up, bikes provided, foods provided, the day to day is all figured out. They just have to show up and and you know you guys take care of the rest. That's it, yeah, pretty much. So um, the the group of Americans that we had, um, four of them brought their own bikes, um, flew over with them. Everybody else borrowed a bike. Everybody else was was on the company's bikes, and yeah, you you, you start off in the morning. You have a little briefing. You get told when your brew stop is, your little brew van. So you ride 15, 20 mile. You stop, you have a cup of tea if you want, can of Coke, whatever you want. There's always sweets or, you know, pastries or anything to eat. Jump on your bike again, again, another 15, 20 mile. And then you get to a, a cafe. You sit down in a cafe or you have a big picnic where you're all sat around chatting. Jump on your bike again. You have another brew stop. And then after that, you ride on to the finish. Uh, your bags will be in your rooms waiting for you. Uh, and then everybody goes out and enjoys the town, whatever, wherever they want to go, wherever they want to eat that night. So, and it's usually a free choice on a night, uh, unless it's some tiny town in the middle of nowhere, and, and then we all eat together. Uh. Yeah. So I'm, and I guess what skill levels are, are going in this? Because uh, I, I'm doing a 50 mile bike ride next week as an event, and I'm probably a little underprepared for it, but I'll be I'll be fine. And we used to do this this 50 mile bike ride once a summer. And uh, there was people that showed up and, you know, didn't have any experience. They, they would still knock it out in four or five hours. Um, yeah. But it sounds like you're doing like 75 to 100 miles a day on these tours. Uh, well, it, the, the, this one down through France, the longest day is only 80 miles. So it's not that bad. Okay. Um, and then the shortest day, I don't know if you've heard of Mont Ventoux. The ride over Mount Mont Ventoux, uh, and it's just some massive, massive extinct volcano down in Provence. Uh, and it's also one of the easiest days because it's 40 miles, and yet you've got 10 mile on the flat. You ride 10 mile up this mountain, which takes about two hours for most people. Uh, and then once you're at the top, it's 20 mile downhill all the way to where you're sleeping. So you've only got to pedal your bike 20 miles, but it is the big iconic day that everybody looks forward to. Oh. That's cool. One one thing I'm finding with this podcast and just talking to different people is how many unique tours there are. Like, I, I guess I never would have thought unless I, I never would have thought to even look for like a bike tour like this. And, uh, you know, one of my buddies, he's doing something similar with Enduros, like uh, Enduro mountain bikes. So you, yeah. you sign up, you go to Taiwan, Vietnam, whatever, and you rent a bike and he tours you around whatever country you're in. Um, yeah. And then there's this girl who does the same thing in her state in 
in uh, I, I don't remember what state it was, um, but they do like hiking tours where moms mm-hmm. and families can sign up and then they, you know, guide you through a little multi-day hike and you get to, you know, meet all the moms that are in your group and stuff. Um, it's just, it's just like really interesting and cool. All the different businesses that are popping up with these, these like tour ideas. Yeah. There's, there's definitely a market out there for people who want to see it. And it, it might just be somebody who, um, it might be somebody on their own who just wants to go with the group, but they don't know who to go to. They're fairly new to it. It might be a couple of mates who, um, who don't want to carry their own kit. They don't want to camp and they want us to take care of it all. So yeah, there's, and, um, uh, people who might be nervous about navigation, it could be anything, you know, people who they don't know how to change a puncture. So they come on a tour group knowing that anything goes wrong, there's going to be a guide not too far behind him who's going to who's going to catch up and change it for him. So it could be any, any numerous, you know, reasons as to why they do it. And uh, everybody seems to come back whenever we, uh, you always finish the tour or even at the start of the tour and you say, who's done one of these before? And there's always at least half of the group who's done a different tour, very, very similar to that. And people love it and keep coming back, and you know there's a good reason for that. Uh. That's really cool. Uh, so you're you're doing this, and like I know that you also do competitions or, or rather events. Um, yeah. Can you maybe go into some of the events that you've done lately? And I, I believe that you actually did one down in Africa, which you know yeah. add to your list of places you've been to on a bike. Um, yeah, just just tell us about how often you're doing these events and where you're going for them. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was doing all the touring and things like that, and you always want to do something a little bit more exciting. Um, so if you're doing a hundred mile a day when you're touring and you're carrying your tent and everything, you might just sling your tent into a field somewhere and have four hours sleep and then wake up and sneak off before the farmer gets back. But um, and then these events started cropping up. And these ultra events are exactly that. It's just, it's for me, it's just fast touring. People call them bikepacking events, call it what you want, you know, but it, to me, it's just very fast touring. Uh, and it's just fantastic because somebody else organizes this incredible route and then you get to go and experience it and you get to go and experience it with full similar to yourself, you know. So, yeah, uh, some of them I've done... Uh, You've previously had on the podcast the HT550, which is 550 miles around Scotland off-road. Uh, the Atlas Mountain Race, that was, I can't remember how far that was. I think that was about six or 700 miles through Morocco, so over the high Atlas Mountains and then into the desert. Uh, the Rovaniemi 150, that was only 150 kilometres, so that wasn't especially far. But that takes place up in Finland in like minus 20 in the snow. Uh, and it's a pretty unique event as well in that the, the similar ones in America, the idea of a bike, but um, a lot of that depends on how cold it is and the snow. So you might just have to end up walking 150k if it's especially bad. If you're lucky, you might be able to ride. Uh, but yeah, just anything. It's If it captures, there's, there's that many events about. I'll be reading about all the different ones, but something will suddenly get inside my head and then that's it. I've got to go and do it. Um but th- this year, the one that got me this year is uh, Ordax rides. I think you call them randonneurs or randonneurs in America. And it's a long distance cycling association. So this year, I'm right. I'm going to be riding just in two or three weeks' time from the bottom of Spain all the way home. It's called Trafalgar Trafalgar. Uh, so that's 2,000 miles and it's a limit of 15 days. You've got to do at least 130 mile a day. But again, it's it's an event, but it's not an event. You can ride it whenever you want. Uh, but you just get given, they call it a brevet book, and it's just a book, and you get to certain towns, and you've got to find, like, a post office maybe, or uh, a policeman perhaps, and he just signs your book uh, and dates it to prove that you've been there. So it's something as simple as that even, but it's just something that captured me, so I get to ride across Spain and France in in a few weeks' time, you know, 130 mile a day in the sunshine, fingers crossed. <laughs> but, yeah. Does that one have, like, a, a mass start, or is it all self-guided? That's just all on your own. Yeah, that's all on your own. So it's called uh, a permanent. So you can ride it whenever you want. Uh, you've just got right. to send off for your book. And it costs a fortune. I think it cost me £10 <laughs> for this book. And that is it. So it's brilliant. It's so informal. It's fantastic. And you just get this little handwritten book from this fellow up in Scotland. 
that you've got to get signed in various little towns. So I just I can't wait for that one. That's just going to be amazing. And some of the places it takes, it takes you to like through Ronda, which is the massive old fire duct. You might have seen it on some of the pictures. It's like this incredible cliff top village. You get to ride through the centre of Paris, through the centre of Madrid, you go over Andorra, over the Pyrenees, right through the middle of France, through the Massif Central. So you just again you'll get to see some incredible places. You'll get to see what's round that next corner for two thousand miles and I can't wait. You said you said earlier that these events have started popping up. Do you think that it's just gotten more popular because of the rise of the internet or what? Like you've been biking for a long time and, and it sounds like yeah. these events didn't always exist and now they're just everywhere. Yeah, I, I think there's two reasons, and I might be wrong, but this is only my view uh, and others might disagree, but I think there's two main reasons as to why they're suddenly so massive. And one is definitely the internet. You know, you can, you can go onto Instagram now and there's so much inspiration there from people who are doing these events. And that's where I pick up a lot of ideas from as well and where you hear about a lot of things. And it's all on Facebook and Instagram and it just looks incredible. Um, and then the other one is um, your GPS devices. Uh, a lot of people used to struggle with maps and things like that. But now you get your GPS device, you put it on your on your bike and you just follow a line on the floor. And you can't really get lost. <laughs> and it's almost as simple as that. Added in some of the kit as well, maybe makes it a little bit easier. Some of the better kit now, you know, I mean, even going back 30 years, the waterproofs weren't great. But now you can go into some incredible places and know that you'll be safe because you've got some good kit. You know you can get out of there because you've got this amazing uh, GPS device. Uh, you, you, you'll have people around you so you can go into these incredible places knowing that if the shit really did it, the fan, somebody might be there to help you out. But uh, yeah, and then the internet. You know that people have done it before, and you're inspired to go and do it as well. You know, other people want to see what's around that corner as well. You you said two things there. Like one of the things that I'm really enjoying about this podcast is it's it's like scratching my own itch. Like hearing about this, I want to go and do a bike tour now. Like I I, I bike a little bit, but I think these bike packing things are so cool and such a unique way, way to see stuff. And so I'm trying to get inspiration. I'm trying to inspire other people by you know, sharing your story and, and whatnot. And then like, you, you mentioned the GPS thing. And as I'm interviewing people and learning about different events around, um, it, it is like, it's fascinating that you can just go onto track leaders and watch a race happen live just by like staring at a pin on a map um, and yeah. seeing how everyone's jockeying against each other. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and and to your point, you're doing that self guided event. They there's all these events popping up around the world where you can do the mass start where everybody meets at one location at the same time to start and race each other, or now that they design the route and everything, the GPS coordinates are already made, why not give that away for free and let people just ride this stuff on their own? Um yeah. it, it's just it is totally fascinating the the you know you know, all the things that are available and how cheap it is yeah. to do some of the stuff. Um, yeah. Like one of my favorite trips that I ever did, um, the mass start events are amazing because you meet so many like-minded people. Uh, and then you end up following what they're doing and the inspiration just carries you forward all the time. Mm -hmm. It's um, self-funding almost, the, the, the ideas that you get. Uh, and then there's other places. So somebody might just put a route up. So two years ago, um, me and a friend just went to Iceland and spent two weeks riding through the middle of Iceland both ways. We went all the way up and then we came all the way back down. But that was fantastic because we were the only two people that were there. So we'd go for a few days without seeing people. We'd have we had at one point we had nine days of food on his back because there was nothing. You know, you might find a hut that you could stay in overnight or something like that. You know. You might find some geothermal pool that you could sit in and rewarm, but that was the uh, that was the appeal of that just being on your own for two weeks in the middle of nowhere and not seeing anybody. So as fantastic as these events are, where you meet people and like-minded people, it's also great to sometimes go the other way and just be out on your own, you know. So yeah, it's great. And, and again, the GPS opens that up. Um, the first people to go across um, Iceland were. Uh, in my club back in the in the 50s or 60s it was and they talked about some of the kit that they took and how on earth they navigated across a landscape like that i have no idea 
I mean, they didn't have maps like we have now, but wow, to have the balls to go and do that. They took a raft with them. They actually took a raft with them and blew it up to get across some of the to get across some of the big rivers. But now, of course, we've got these GPS systems and we know the safest place to go across because we know somebody else has done it. So it does make it a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. That's nuts. I need to I need to find like a race coordinator or something or find find the guy who designed that event that you're gonna do in, in a few weeks and just kinda of understand what went into designing that route. I'm sure that would be a fascinating conversation. Um yeah, so I always like to leave time at the end of the episode for, for my guests to just tell stories and I feel like we've covered so much, so is there is there any like funny stories that come to mind or inspiring stories that you wanna like leave the listeners with oh god i've no idea i mean stories i mean some of them all the funniest stories are always the bad ones aren't they so those um, are the best ones we get to laugh at you and, yeah uh, and yeah i mean god let me think i mean uh, going to the uh, the ht 550 i mean that was a pretty bad one so i think it was on about day three i think maybe you do this horrific traverse across this mountain it's called the postman's path you basically pushing your bike for about four or six hours and you get to the end and there's a tiny little village and me and my mate we knew that the cafe opened at 8 a.m it was about 4 a.m at this point so we just laid our camp mats down on this little village green and you're unconscious at this point you're three or four days in you've not been sleeping much you know maybe four hours a night at most so you're fast asleep your alarm goes off in the morning and you kind of wake up and i start packing all my kit away and as i'm packing my kit up i'm like <laughs> what is what is that smell and i'm looking around everywhere and then eventually i lifted my mat up and i put it down on the biggest dog <laughs> poo <laughs> you've ever seen in your life so then you've got this camp mat that you then need for another three days absolutely smothered in dog muck and what do you do with that <laughs> so i try to rinse it off in the river and clean it as best i can but at the end of the day you've still got to wrap it up and put it inside your bag and drag it out at <laughs> the next day and the worst thing is you've got to blow the bugger up. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Just anything like that, you know. There's, uh, there's, yeah, endless, endless tales of all kinds of stuff. So, <laughs> but, That's uh, so funny. <laughs> maybe it was horrible. You get no sleep, <laughs> and then you're just, you're just cussing yourself out for the next few hours. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I did get home and put that mat in the bin. I couldn't even bear to clean it. <laughs> yeah. But I should have written down some of these stories, but uh, yeah, there's all, there's all kinds, yeah, never ending. In fact, one of the most amazing tales, actually, we were in Vietnam, and uh, you know the Chu Chi tunnels where they all all the Vietnamese used to hide. They built all these incredible tunnels, tiny okay. little things, and um, you, if you put on a little bit too much weight, you'd never fit in them. They're amazing. Like to climb in them, you've got your hands above your head like this to get in. Tiny little tunnels. And uh, they have little guides who take you around. So somebody guided us around them all. And uh, the maps that we had were from, this is 20 years ago when I went there. These maps were from the 60s, the old military maps. And they were absolutely pointless. There were loads of new infrastructure that isn't on these maps. So we set off from this place and we'd been riding. We'd done about, I don't know, 40, 50 miles. And we're going down this massive road. I can imagine it's like a freeway in America. This brand new, pristine tarmac road. And we're riding down it. And we knew where the sun was. This is back in the day before GPS systems. And we knew we were going in the wrong direction, but we didn't know where we were going. It was just We were just in this incredibly green spot. And um, we're just riding along thinking, wow, well, we'll just, we'll just see where we end up. And this dude turns up on a motorbike, open face helmet. He's like, oh, yeah, you all right? We're like, yeah, thanks. He's like, I was your guide. I was your guide in the tunnels. I'm like, oh, my God, it is. It is as well. He says, do you know where you're going? We went, no, we're lost. So we stopped and we looked at this map. And he's like, yeah, yeah, this road isn't on the map. Come with me. So we get behind this motorbike and we're drafting this motorbike as best we can. <laughs> road about 20 miles. Got to this town and uh, walks in and he goes, Mum, I've got these two guests who are staying with us tonight. And we ended up just staying in this guy's house and sleeping on his floor, who we just happened to meet, <laughs> who was our guide. Uh, just a few hours before so they gave us this incredible Vietnamese meal we stayed overnight we woke up in the morning we had an incredible breakfast with them and then uh, we still didn't know where we were 
and he got this map out and he kind of drew this little route on this map and we get on in the morning and rode down this road and eventually yeah we got to where we knew where we were onto a road that was on this old map <laughs> but tales like that it's just amazing you're not going to get that going from town to town in a car are you you know so, no it, yeah, it's, it's great it's wild how, how often people like open up to you when you're you're traveling or you are like i said wearing that hobby on your on your back like i don't know yeah you did a tour with a guy and he let you stay at a spot like that seems so uncommon unsafe and whatever and you guys probably felt totally comfortable with all of it yeah yeah it was brilliant that's, and it's funny to say actually the guy who i did that tour with um i i was a french speaker and uh, we do we'd, we'd be doing his tours and whenever we went anywhere like i went around eastern europe with him as well and obviously walking somewhere new like a cafe and the first thing you say is uh do you speak english and if they said no I'd always then say, oh, do you speak French in French? And if they said no, my friend was Welsh, which I don't know if you've ever heard the Welsh language. It sounds like nothing you've ever heard on earth. Uh, and he'd just come out with these words that even I didn't understand. And it was just a running joke because everybody would just be like, eyes like saucers, like, what the hell is this guy saying? <laughs> <laughs> but that was always a neat little touch, you know. <laughs> Your language is worthless here, bud. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, th this was good, man. I I really enjoyed this and hearing about some of the different places that biking has taken you. Um, is there anything else you want to cover? Otherwise, we can we can go into shout outs and you can let the know let the guests know, you know, where they can find you. Ah, uh, no, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and. Uh... We'll just close it up. From uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I'm on Strava, so I mean, you can probably find me on Strava, but there's probably a thousand Michael Collinses on there. Uh, I think the picture I'm stood with my fat bike when I was in Finland. So if there's some snow in the background, that might be me. Uh, and then I do a little bit on Instagram as well. So it's Mick uh, underscore Collins underscore one, I believe. So yeah, you can probably find me on there as well. Thank you for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback, or share your Type 2 Fun story.